Do you general managers in the NFL like trading down more than Seahawks general manager John Schneider? Which teams might be candidates for the Seahawks to move down from number nine overall in the first round? Rob Rang and I are going to be breaking down six teams to watch as we head into the 2022 NFL Draft on our latest installment of Locked on Seahawks. You are Locked on Seahawks, your daily Seattle Seahawks podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Greetings, 12. This is Corbin Smith, your host for Locked On Seahawks. Joining me for our special edition Easter episode, my co-host in crime, Rob Rang. Hope everybody is enjoying time with their family, celebrating the holiday. If you celebrate the holiday, of course, we've got a draft coming up less than two weeks away. Normally, this would be Mock Draft Monday, but... For this special occasion, it's Mock Draft Sunday, and we're going to be looking at some of the latest mock drafts out there on the internet, playing a little bit of a ranking game today, and we'll be looking at some trade-down possibilities. Everyone knows John Schneider is already looking forward to the possibility of recouping picks if he can, and there's some intriguing candidates to trade down from number nine overall in the first round. This episode's brought your way by Bet Bet BetOnline has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet online where the game starts. Now for your lead story here on our special Sunday edition of Locked on Seahawks. There's not really news out there, but that makes this an interesting discussion topic, Rob, because you and I have been covering the NFL for a long time. You've been covering it longer than I have. Not an old age joke, but you've been around the block. I've been around the block now. We've covered multiple NFL off seasons, and I don't know that I have ever seen a free agent period that started off as fast as this one did and then just kind of died. And that's been the way that it's been for the last month. I mean, you really had a week where there were deals and then suddenly everything just seems to slow down and just to a screeching halt, it was done. There's been a few signings here and there, but it seems like this has been a league-wide trend this year, which I wasn't necessarily expecting because the salary cap jumped back up. I thought teams were going to be a lot more aggressive but that tells me teams are taking this draft much more seriously than they have the last couple of years. And there's a number of reasons for that. There are a number of reasons for that, Corbin. And I would agree with you. I think that, uh, especially from a Seahawk perspective, as we talked about how much money that, that it appeared that Seattle had under the cap, um, and I think that there was a lot of excitement about how Seattle might be able to kind of exploit that salary cap space in free agency. And of course, they, they did make some from pretty intriguing signings, but things have fizzled a little bit here recently. And I think a big part of that, and an, an underreported, element of this is the fact that of course this draft class is just bigger than we've ever seen before the ncaa when they decided to to give college football players an extra year of eligibility due to the pandemic there were a lot of players corbin who would have been eligible in last year's draft class and then instead returned to college football a perfect example of that would be the Pittsburgh quarterback, Kenny Pickett, um, who, of course, now is projected as a possible first-round selection, maybe even to Seattle. Um, but instead, he wound up returning. And so this draft class is literally bigger, deeper, and more talented than just about any that we have seen. And so I think that that's one of the reasons why you were seeing so many NFL teams out there make the big trades rather than going into free agency. And right now, even if the Easter holiday and, and happy holidays to all those who celebrate, as you mentioned, happy Ramadan as well to all those who celebrate that holiday. Uh, you know, I think the NFL teams right now are, are not painting Easter eggs. They, I think they're hunkered down in their facilities and really evaluating this draft class, Corbin, because I think, again, it is a very unique year, a very unique draft class. Yeah, I definitely think the size of this draft class, and I remember that there were reports out there during the draft a year ago that teams were not wanting to part ways with their 2022 draft picks because they viewed them as gold mines. And you're seeing why, because you have all these players that would have, they would have been forced to go into the NFL draft last year because they were seniors. They get to come back with that extra year of eligibility and that has made this a very saturated, talented draft class. And so 
there's certainly some position groups like quarterback that are not viewed as highly. But overall, this is a pretty deep draft class that we've been breaking down over the last couple of months. And so that certainly has played into this. And I think that's one of the reasons, as you mentioned, the trades, that teams are trying to stockpile multiple first-round picks. We saw the, the Saints trade back in. And now they have two first-rounders in the top 20. The Eagles still have two, even after trading out one of those picks to the Saints. You've got teams like the Packers that have two of them, the Chiefs, that had traded away star receivers. And now they have two first-rounders to try to replace that player. And so teams were really fighting to get back in the first round. And maybe that's why Russell Wilson got moved this year, too. Maybe last season, John Schneider was like, you know what? We haven't had normal scouting. I'm not giving up my star quarterback for a first-round pick this year. But in 2022, when we have had much more normal scouting up to this point, maybe not a fully normal situation last college football season, but far closer to normal than we had the previous year with the pandemic, that has certainly played a factor. So now you get teams like the Seahawks that are more than willing to get back in the first round because they feel more informed and it's a deep, talented draft class. And so that's why you've got a lot of really good free agents that are still out there. Like I said, this, this has just been – I don't want to use the word unprecedented because there have been off seasons that have been slower, but like this really was in terms of free agency. We talked for weeks about how there's going to be so much player movement and there was in trades, but in free agency, there are a lot of good players still out there that have not signed deals. And I don't know that they will have one now until after the draft teams are hunkered down, as you said, and they are in evaluation mode. They're getting ready for a few weeks from now in Las Vegas. And after that, then we will have another real flurry of free agent activity when teams know what needs they still have to fill. Yeah, exactly. And again, just look at it from the Seattle's perspective. I think that we all expected that, um, you know, it, something was going to happen with Dwayne Brown and Brandon Shell by this point, whether or not they'd be resigning with Seattle or going elsewhere. So again, that's just kind of one example of the fact that there are some very established NFL players who are still kind of waiting around to see where they might line up. And again, I think the NFL teams and their scouts are, are very much um, just looking into this draft class now and not worrying about free agency. They will deal with the veteran players once that the draft is over. And then you mentioned some of the teams out there that have those multiple first round picks. There's eight of them. I mean, think about that. That, that is a quarter of the NFL has multiple first round selections in this 20. 22 draft class. Corbin, I, I'm anticipating absolute chaos to a roughly a week and a half from now when we have the 2022 NFL draft. I think you're going to see teams that are going to be very aggressive in moving up and trading back. And of course, as we talked about, John Schneider is so well known for being kind of trader John and developing that reputation. I think that he's going to be right smack in the middle of things as the Seahawks always are. Yeah, every year it feels like, and last year was an ad, you know, kind of a, uh, what word about looking for? Last year was definitely an exception to the rule because they only had three picks, and he did move around once. But when you only have three selections, it really limits your ability to be able to impact the draft board the way that John Schneider likes to. And so you know he's going to be entertaining calls. You know that he's going to be talking offers. Does that mean they're going to move from number nine? We don't know. But I can assure you one thing. There are going to be several teams that are below them at number nine that Schneider is going to be wanting to pick the phone up if, if the situation's right, and he's going to want to make some calls. So we'll be talking about that later in the show, taking a look at which teams could be candidates to trade down and why, maybe throwing together some mock trade proposals here on Mock Draft Sunday as well. BetOnline.net is your number one source for all your betting stats and sports information. Find all the latest sports developments, league reviews, and news, including this year's basketball playoffs and the start of the Major League Baseball season. BetOnline is your continued source for all of your sporting and wagering informational needs. From live betting to the playoffs, esports, and more, head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. BetOnline, where the game starts. You're listening to the Locked On Seahawks podcast, Easter Sunday edition. I'm your host, Corbin Smith. Joining me as always, Rob Rang. Thanks for making Locked On Seahawks your first listen five days a week. And make sure to check out coming up on Thursday, April 28th, with the NFL Draft coming, we've got Locked On NFL Draft's live coverage all three days. Real-time analysis from our extensive lineup of experts and insiders. And for those of you dying to know who your team is going to take, 
Make sure to catch Odyssey and Locked On's NFL Mock Draft Special hosted by Brian Peacock and former NFL scout Matt Williamson of the Peacock and Williamson NFL Show all week leading up to the first selection by the Jaguars. All right, it's Mock Draft Sunday, and we've been mixing this up each week. Some weeks we look at fan-submitted mocks. Sometimes we look at our own mock drafts. Sometimes we just you know, scan over mock drafts from other experts out there. We're going to do that today with a little bit of a twist. Usually we just run down the players, and this is who's picked at number nine. But this time, Rob, I'm going to read off five different mock drafts that have been posted in the last 72 hours. And we are going to debate which selection we would be most excited about if we were looking from a Seahawks perspective and which mock draft we would maybe be most lukewarm about. And again, these are all first round mocks. So just one selection in each. We've got five different players. So without further ado, here we go. Our first one, we got a couple from CBS Sports. Man, they kick out mock drafts like crazy. Uh, A lot of different viewpoints. This one from Jared Dubin, Jermaine Johnson, defensive end from Florida State. The other CBS Sport one from Kyle Stackpole, Akem Ekwonu, the tackle from North Carolina State. And then our third one here, NFL.com, Lance Zerline, the former scout, has Derek Stingley, the corner from LSU, going to the Seahawks at number nine. Then from Pro Football Focus, Anthony Treesh. Tackle Evan Neal from Alabama falling all the way to number nine. And our last one from Sporting News, Joe Rivera. We've got another tackle, Charles Cross, a popular pick out of Mississippi State. He's been picked in a lot of mock drafts in Seahawks at number nine. So we've got five scenarios there. I guess I'm going to ask you this first. Let's let's start on the negative side of things, then we can finish on a positive note here on Easter. But of these five mock drafts, if you are looking from a Seahawks perspective, which one would be the toughest sell for you? Which one would be the most unappealing? Uh, I, I think that all of them are are fairly appealing. I think all of them definitely, um, you know, fill areas of concern. But at the same time, I am not as high on Charles Cross, the offensive tackle for Mississippi State, as some folks seem to be. And a big part of the reason for that, Corbin, is just the fact that I believe that Charles Cross is a much better pass blocker than run blocker. I think even with Seattle likely to be switching their offense a little bit more, even more run heavy this upcoming season, obviously you have a different quarterback, then I I just don't know that Charles Cross is the, the people mover at the point of attack that really fits in with the Seahawks like to do. I like all five of these players that are getting mocked to the Seahawks, and we have talked about them. I just, number nine for me, what I'm looking at here is from a value perspective. I think that you can make an argument that all five of these players could be top 10 caliber players in this draft. But I'm with you. When I look at a scheme standpoint, a personnel standpoint, if the Seahawks are following what the Rams model has been under Sean McVay, they like big body tackles. I just don't I don't see Charles Cross being a fit from that standpoint and you look at his tape, I think he's better as a run blocker maybe than some are advertising, but that is not the strength in his game. And there are some technical issues that jump out when you're watching his pass protection. In particular for me, something that I think is definitely correctable, but he has his hands really low a lot of the time when pass rushers are approaching him, and he gets delayed contact with pass rushers. You do that in the NFL, you are going to get butchered. So he's going to have to fix that. I think he is very sound in pass pro in a lot of regards. There are some technical things, though, that worry me a little bit. I just Number nine might be a little bit rich for me to pick him, and I've I've certainly mocked him there a couple times, but that would be a guy when we talk trade downs later. If I can still get him dropping down a few spots, I feel better about that pick than picking him at number nine. So for me personally, I would agree with you on that, maybe for a little different reasons, but that would be the one guy of these five that maybe inside the top 10, it would be the toughest sell for me. 
Yeah, it would be for me. And then to me, the, the next four guys are all kind of about the same spot because as we've talked about, I mean, this is something that, that Seattle has prioritized in the past is when they initially built their roster. Of course, John Schneider and Pete Carroll's number one selection together was Russell Lukung, number six overall, 12 years ago in 2010. So to me, it makes a lot of sense with this roster rebuild that you're seeing. The fact that, uh, again, Dwayne Brown and, and Brandon Shell are not on the roster currently, then you know, if Seattle was to see a guy like Ike Aquanu still on the board or Evan Neal still on the board, then it, it makes an awful lot of sense. I mean, these are two guys that almost to a man, every time I talk to scouts, those two players are viewed as virtually consensus top 10 players, whereas Cross is not. And then I have to admit, I, I am really intrigued by Derek Stingley, the cornerback, I know that Seattle has not prioritized that position um, in, in the past. The earliest, uh, you know, that they've used a pick on a cornerback was third, late third round all those years ago with, with Shaquille Griffin. But Stingley is a different level of talent. And, and so I think that they would have to be intrigued by that. Of course, his former head coach, Ed Orgeron, Pete Carroll is as tight with Ed Orgeron as he is with anybody. We've talked about that in the past as well. So I would be really intrigued by him. And then, again, a player that I personally am very high on, I've projected to the Seahawks in the past, Jermaine Johnson. I just really like his positional versatility. He can be that defensive end. He can be that off-ball linebacker. I, I like the lateral agility. I love the power. I love the variety of different pass rush techniques that he uses. Um, I just don't know that he's going to be available to them. So mm -hmm. if, if you're asking qu quickly who my favorite player is in this class, just because of the immediate impact ability, I think that he might be able to provide again i'm gonna go with johnson but i would love it from a seahawk perspective if they were able to get any of those four players i think that all of them are going to wind up being steals if available at number nine overall so i'm going to say this right now i think of those five players if everything falls in line looking at the scheme can stay healthy bounces back from two kind of subpar years at lsu uh, to me Derek stingley has the highest ceiling of any of these five players I truly believe that. If you watch it, and I know you watched his freshman year when LSU won it all, and he had six interceptions, he is such a ball hawk, an incredible athlete, very instinctive, and he can do it all. The last two years, though, he just hasn't been able – he's had injuries and other things going on. LSU has not been as good around him. So you've seen flashes, but if you can get the 2020 – 2019 and the 2020 version of Derek Stingley in your secondary, if you can get him at number nine overall, and he blossoms in this defensive scheme that's going to have more man coverage, which he's one of those guys that can do both, but he is a very good man cover corner. You bring him in with the rest of the secondary that the Seahawks have, could have the highest ceiling. With that being said, we're talking about best pick of these five in terms of being a sure thing. If Evan Neal falls to number nine. John Schneider is going to have that draft card submitted literally when the commissioner is done saying Seahawks are on the clock. It'll be in that quick. I mean, this guy, I don't see him getting out of the top five. I've seen a few mock drafts lately where he has, but I just can't see a, a physical specimen like Evan Neal who doesn't look like an offensive lineman when you see him running. Like he just doesn't, but he's, 330 pounds. I mean, he's a huge dude, just in incredible shape. There's not much fat on that guy. And oh, by the way, he's a darn good football player on top of that. He's played guard. He's played tackle. I think he's a tackle in the NFL. That would be the one of these five that I would be most excited about. But I think if you're looking at potential, which can be a dangerous word in this business, but if you're looking from a potential standpoint, then Derek Stingley would be the guy that I think of this group would have the highest upside. There's just a lot more ifs to me in regard to him than Evan Neal. Yeah, I, I would agree with you. Uh, I think that, you know, I, and I love the fact that you mentioned the positional versatility with Evan Neal, because obviously that has been something that Seattle has prioritized so often. And, yeah. you know, wouldn't it just be a Pete Carroll, John Schneider type of selection to go with an Alabama player if he was there? Again, an LSU player. I mean, they they love to draft players from big time programs that have gone against elite competition. It just makes the evaluation that much easier. And to kind of contrast what Evan Neal has done with, say, a guy like Charles Cross, again, 
We're still talking about the SEC, of course. But at the same time, you watch how many times that Evan Neal had to put his hand in the ground and come out of the three-point stance, yep. whereas Charles Cross is almost always in that two-point stance. And he is viewed as only a left tackle by most clubs. And that is a good thing and from a lot of perspectives. But Evan Neal, I think, the, because, and Kwanu as well, the, the, just the, the physicality which he plays, that he would make a lot of sense also. I just think that they met very much match up better with what Seattle has prioritized, at least in the past, much more so than Charles Cross. Yeah, and I think you're still getting a really, really darn good athlete on top of that. So if you're if you're a listener like, well, 330-pound tackle probably doesn't move very well. Go watch Evan Neal's pro day workout. Go find clips of it or go see what he did at the combine. I mean, this guy, like I said, does not look like an offensive lineman. And he's coming from a scheme. Yes, Alabama has modernized some and they're running more spread concepts, but they still run the football. And so you know that you're going to be getting a pro running lineman coming in that's had his hand in the dirt and has gotten after it in the trenches in the run game playing at Alabama. So I think that that would be a very intriguing fit. Again, all five of those guys, I think you can make arguments, are top 10 caliber talents in the right situation. So I don't think that necessarily be bad with any of those picks. But it is interesting looking what would be the best values in terms of scheme with a top 10 selection. And certainly a lot of different names being thrown around. And we'll see a few more mock drafts before the actual thing gets here on April 28th. Speaking of the NFL draft, John Schneider, we've mentioned it a few times today. We've talked about it extensively in the past. Few general managers, if any, enjoy trading during the draft, whether it's moving up or down more than what John Schneider does. We're going to be looking at some teams behind the Seahawks that could be prime trade back candidates in the first round of this year's draft here in a moment. If you're like me and you're struggling to stick with your New Year's resolution, you need to try Built Bar. Absolutely delicious, 100% chocolate. Less than 200 calories, less than five net carbs, 17 grams of protein. They're delicious and they're good for you. The perfect pre-workout, post-workout snack, or if you're just looking to satisfy your sweet tooth without ruining your diet, Built Bar checks off all those boxes. If you haven't tried Built Bar Puffs yet, they're incredible. They're basically a marshmallow on steroids. And they come in a bunch of amazing flavors. Banana cream pie being my personal favorite. Regular Built Bars also come in a ton of delicious flavors. Peanut butter brownie. I'll eat an entire five or six pack of those in one sitting. Not embarrassed to admit that. Salted caramel. Orange cream. They got new flavors they're coming out with every month. So make sure to check out their website, Built.com, to see what they are cooking up this month. Use the code LOCK15 and you'll get 15% off your next order. Again, that's at Built.com. Use the code LOCK15 to get 15% off your next order. You're listening to the Locked On Seahawks podcast, Easter Sunday edition. I'm your host, Corbin Smith. Joining me as always, Rob Rang. Thanks for making Locked On Seahawks your first listen five days a week. It's Mock Draft Sunday, and typically during this time, we're looking at which players have been selected by different experts, or we're breaking down fan-submitted mock drafts, or we've been checking out individual prospects. Most of the hay is in the barn now, less than two weeks away from the real draft for us. And so now the big question, which teams would be the best candidates for the Seahawks to potentially trade down in the first round. And I know there are some fans out there, you've got a top 10 pick, use it, go get a blue chip player. But there are a lot of variables at play here when you're the general manager. And if you've got, we just talked about five prospects in the second quarter. If you've got four or five players that you love that are at the top of your big board that are still on the board at number nine, then you would be foolish not to consider trying to trade down, especially if you've got teams calling you about that selection and you have a number of positions that you need to address on both sides of the football like the Seahawks do. Yeah, exactly. That, that's the thing. Uh, you know, I, I think that, that that John Schneider is looking at the fact that there are eight different teams out there with multiple first round picks, kind of like a kid looking out at uh, a field full of Easter eggs, like, oh my goodness, here we go. Uh, I, I think he's excited about the possibility of this. Now, of course, I do not have access to the Seahawks big board, but my own big board, I have eight blue chip players. And of course, the Seahawks are sitting there at number nine overall. So if those eight players, and quickly those eight being the four edge rushers that we've talked about, Ad nauseum, Hutchinson, Walker, Thibodeau, 
and Johnson, and then two cornerbacks, Stingley and Sauce Gardner, and then the two tackles, Aquanu and Evan Neal. If those eight players are off the board, Corbin, then I think that Seattle might be looking to trade back out of number nine because I don't know that they necessarily have a player that they're going to be in love with at that ninth overall selection, unless perhaps – they really want one of these quarterbacks. And if you are a Seahawks fan who is looking to acquire picks, that's what you should be hoping for, is to see if a quarterback winds up going ahead of them. If a quarterback winds up going ahead of them, at least one of the players that I love as far as just a pure talent and their fit in Seattle would have to be available to Seattle at number nine overall. But let's just assume for a moment that John Schneider kind of sticks with what he has done so many times in the past and does try to acquire a few extra draft selections this year. There are six different teams that we talked about that, that would make a lot of sense. Some of them have multiple first round picks. Some of them do not. And so the, the easiest drop down is in terms of just the shortest amount of distance you'd have to go would be a team like the Houston Texans sitting there at number 13 overall. Obviously, you're only dropping a handful of spots, but moving down from number nine to 13, you still might be able to get the number 73 overall selection. That's a very early third round selection. Um, and I think that that might be enough to convince Seattle to be able to move down and still be able to get perhaps a Charles Cross, as we talked about earlier today, um, or, or one of the other really talented football players that might be able to make an immediate impact for this club and i'm going to say this we're we are using the rich hill draft chart not the jimmy johnson one because the jimmy johnson one's been obsolete for like a decade at this point the rich hill model is the one that a lot of nfl teams are using there's actually another model out there that i haven't gotten to explore very much that some teams are starting to use as well so that's something that is consistently changing over time year to year but i think in this situation Obviously, the Texans would want to part ways with number three, that third round pick uh, that they have to move up. But they also have pick number 37 in the second round. And if there is a player that the Texans badly want at number nine and the Seahawks are willing to move down, yes, by the trade chart, the Texans would be getting ripped off. But that's a lot of times what happens for teams that trade up like that. If the Seahawks are trying to move down and they don't have anybody that really is that interested – in moving up, you're not going to get maximum value back. But if you get the right team desperate wanting to trade up, the Texans might be willing to part ways with a pick. And then suddenly the Seahawks would have 37, 40, and 41. You could do some real damage in the second round, reloading your roster with a move like that. And so from the draft chart, that would look like the Texans would never make that deal. But if there's a player they really want then absolutely that could come into play, which leads me to the next team that we have on our list here. The Eagles, they have number 15 and number 18. They did have three first rounders. They traded one of them to the New Orleans Saints who have 16 and 19 now. So you've got two teams there, Rob, that have a pair of first round picks. The Eagles, if they're wanting to go up and get a player like say a Derek Stingley, maybe they want to upgrade their secondary. I could see them wanting to jump up from 15. I could also see them saying, look, we're not going to trade our first first round pick, but we will move number 18. And I know that you had a very interesting proposal if that played out. Yeah, that's the thing. I just the, – the more I look at this draft class, Corbin, the more I think that there is a strong possibility that those eight players I just referred to before are off the board. And, and Seattle is kind of looking to move down. And so if a team is going to move up, then they have to want a player that, uh, you know, they anticipate that either somebody else is going to move up to get from that nine over, overall spot or they're going to want to get ahead of the New York Jets who are seeing there at number 10 overall. Um, and, and so a, a defensive back would make an awful lot of sense, especially if a cornerback like a Derek, Derek Stingley is available um, at that point. And Seattle just feels that's too risky, for example. So I think the Philadelphia Eagles make a lot of, a lot of sense. The Seahawks have done a lot of trades with the Eagles over the years. John Schneider and Howie Roseman are buddies. I, I saw them kind of yucking it up a little bit on the sidelines at the Senior Bowl just a couple of months ago. I think that if Seattle is able to get the number 15 overall selection, obviously that would be better than the number 18 overall selection. But just looking at that Rich Hill trade chart that you mentioned before, there is a scenario in which the numbers actually line up 
perfectly. And that would be if Seattle traded down from number nine to number 18 overall, and then also acquired Philadelphia's number 83 overall pick. That's about midway through the third round. And then pick number 154. That's in the fifth round. And one of the things I like about that is, again, not only is it match up perfectly number wise, it's worth 387 points out there. Again, according to that Rich Hill chart, I also love the fact that it would give Seattle back to back selections in the fifth round. Of course, Seattle already has back to back selections in the second round. It just makes it a lot easier for evaluation standpoint. If you I know think that would actually give them three consecutive picks in the fifth round. Because well, I least- think that they have the pick from Denver there as well. And, and that's, I got to kind of explore that because according to the Rich Hill chart, the Seattle does. According to NFL.com's list, Seattle does not have that. Denver currently has that pick of number 152, I believe. Um, and yeah, so that's that one goes I'm, to the Seahawks. That's their pick. So, yeah, yeah, it'd be 152, 153, 154. So... If that's That'd the case, enough. obviously, it just makes it that much more intriguing. So, again, that's that to me is of all of the different candidates that we talked about, just, we, just as we are kind of evaluating first round picks, if there are first round trade scenarios, we're going to address several of them. This would be the one that I think is the most intriguing from a Seahawks perspective. Well, if we're looking at most intriguing, it's got to be the other team with two first rounders, the New Orleans Saints. And Here's my point of view on this. The Eagles just kind of showed their hand a little bit by saying, we've got three first rounders, but we really like next year's group. So we're going to be willing to take one of the Saints first rounders next year. So now we're going to have a bunch of first round picks next season. We drop down from three to two this year. That tells me there's some faith in Jalen Hurts still. You know what? We're going to give you another year to see if you can be the guy. And we know next year's class is supposedly supposed to be a lot better at the quarterback position, at least in terms of the top prospects that could be available, uh, players like C.J. Stroud, as well as Bryce Young. There's going to be some really intriguing quarterbacks next year's class. But the Saints moving back into the first round a second time, that suggests to me that they're wanting to use those two picks potentially to move into the top 10 so they can go get their quarterback. And so I've outlined this in a couple of our earlier episodes as a possibility, but that might be a case where John Schneider's like, all right, you guys already made the move to get into the first round a second time. You guys want to move up to number nine. You give us both those first round picks and we'll give you our fourth rounder on top of it. So pick number nine and a fourth rounder in exchange for your two first round picks. The Seahawks would win that on the draft chart, but I think that is the type of trade that John Schneider, he would have leverage there. Like I don't have to trade down. If you want to come up and get a quarterback here at number nine, you got to pay the price. And so that's the one that still fascinates me the most. Getting 16 and 19 trading down, you still have two top 20 picks. And that gives you even more leverage to potentially move one of those picks, probably 19. You could move down a few spots again in the first round and get another day two selection out of that. Yeah, I have to agree with you. Um, you know, again, I, I really think that the most realistic in terms of just numbers and the way things work out, I think, again, would be with Philadelphia. But from a just a purely Seahawks standpoint and trying to get as much bang for your buck as you possibly can, then, yeah, if any team, and especially a team like the Saints, who have those two first-round selections, number 16 and number 19 overall, if they are going for a quarterback, and that's something that I think we all understand, that if a team is moving up for a quarterback, then they are much more likely to be willing to give you a little bit more uh, to kind of sweeten the pot to to kind of grease the wheels and make that type of a trade. And so, sure, if any club is willing to give you multiple first round picks, especially those inside the top 20 uh, to move up to number nine overall, if Seattle does not have a player that they're absolutely in love with, then I think that they have to do that. And again, as I talked about before with Howie Roseman and John Schneider, Mickey Loomis in the Saints, um, you know, is somebody that, that Schneider and the Seahawks have worked with very tightly in the past as well. Looking at a couple other possibilities, once you start talking about moving down eight or more picks, this is kind of a double-edged sword. On one hand, when you go down that far, you can get really good compensation back because teams, when they're vaulting up eight to ten picks, you have to pay a, a pretty penny to do that. But it also could take you out of the running. If you have four or five guys on the board you really like, they might all be gone by the time you get back up on the clock. So there's more risk with it. There are three teams that jumped out to you and I before the show that we talked about. The Chargers at 17, that is a team that seems to be on the cusp of being a up-and-coming contender in the AFC. They've just missed the playoffs last two years. they got a great young quarterback in Justin Herbert. 
There are still some holes in that roster, though, a few of them. I could see that being a team that wants to move up to maybe address their offensive line again or maybe add another player in the secondary, maybe add another receiver to the mix. If there's a player they really want, I could see them having interest in number nine. What works against them, they don't have a second rounder. So from Seattle's perspective, the best you could maybe get, you could look at future picks or you could get a third rounder from them in the middle of the third round. But that one doesn't necessarily jump out to me. Now, number 20, the Pittsburgh Steelers, they might want a quarterback that you want. We don't know how much Seattle's interest in Desmond Ritter really is. But if he's their guy, Pittsburgh is another team that has been linked to him several times. They had him in for a visit. So if Pittsburgh trades up to number nine, that might be a player that they are targeting. Maybe they're trying to get the quarterback that you want. So you have to consider that. But you could get their number 20 overall pick. You could get, I believe it's number 52 in the second round. And you could ask for pick 138 on top of that. And I think that would be a reasonable starting point for them at number 20 and the furthest that I would go down is the Green Bay Packers at 22 but if you're dropping down 13 spots you better believe if I'm John Schneider I'm not giving them as our buddy Peter Bukowski of Locked on Packers calls a hometown discount not going to be doing that you're going to need to pay up 22 and 28 in the first round if you want to move all the way up to number nine and that would be about the right price point. It absolutely would. And, uh, you know, again, I think that it would be difficult. We talked before about the possibility in a, in a previous episode of, of Green Bay uh, trading a whole bunch of picks for DK Metcalf and how much that just might sting Seahawk fans just to see him going to Green Bay of all teams. And so I think that this is the least likely of the scenarios. But again, if you have a club who's willing to trade you two first round picks, considering the variety of different needs that the Seahawks have in the depth, then yeah, I think that that's a candidate. Um, but I, I would go back really quickly to the two AFC teams that we just talked about, the, San, the excuse me, Los Angeles Chargers and the Pittsburgh Steelers. Again, if the Chargers are moving up, then who are they moving up for? And I can tell you, I think there's a good possibility that the free safety Kyle Hamilton from Notre Dame might be on the board. The Jets at number 10 have a hole a little bit at the free safety position. They might very much be targeting Kyle Hamilton at that spot. If the Chargers were to move up and steal him at that spot. I, I think that they might be very aggressive in doing so. And they have drafted an awful lot of Notre Dame players over the last couple of years. First round pick and Jerry Tillery a couple of years ago, linebacker True Dranquil. Uh, you know, th- they've they've gone to South Bend to get some players in the past. And the Steelers, as again, as you talked about, Corbin, with the quarterbacks, whether it be a guy like a Malik Willis or a Desmond Ritter, I think those are the two quarterbacks that are likely to be the most intriguing to Seattle. They're likely to be the most intriguing to Pittsburgh as well. I just love the way that Malik Willis and Desmond Ritter would both fit in with what Mike Tomlin has always preached. And talk about relationships with general managers. Kevin Colbert is looking to retire after this year. I think he wants to hit that home run and be able to retire uh, and walk off into the sunset knowing that his team that he has been with all these years in Pittsburgh has their quarterback of the past or the, of the future already on the roster. So I would not be surprised at all to see Pittsburgh, which is rare that they are that aggressive. But I think that this is the year that the Pittsburgh Steelers might be super aggressive. Seattle might be able to win because of that. They're in the same spot the Seahawks are in. They've got Mitch Trubisky right now atop the depth chart. Not a guy that has been a proven starter in the NFL, uh, flamed out with the Bears. We saw Drew Locke do that in Denver. So both teams are in a similar spot. I certainly think that that is a team that could make sense if Seattle is willing to move down that far. I would think the first three teams we mentioned would be more likely because I don't think John Schneider wants to move down that many spots unless he's getting a King's ransom back in return in terms of draft compensation. But we'll see. Anything can happen when the mad scientist John Schneider is at work in the Seahawks draft room as always thanks for making locked on seahawks your first listen five days a week now make your second listen the locked on nfl draft podcast ryan tracy and former nfl quarterback eric crocker bring the nfl draft to life every day with insight and analysis on college football prospects and nfl front offices it's free and available wherever you get podcasts you can follow me on twitter at corbin smith nfl you can follow rob at rob rang Make sure to check out the Locked On Seahawks podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and of course, five days a week streaming on YouTube. When we return on Tuesday, going to take our Monday off. 
with our special edition Sunday show here. When we return on Tuesday, we're going to continue previewing the upcoming NFL draft. In fact, we're going to dig into our final mock draft. We're going to be doing one pick a day leading up to the draft. And so this is going to be all the hay in the barn, our final opportunity to pick a new draft class for the Seahawks. We're really looking forward into diving deep into each and every selection that we make for the Seahawks. You won't want to miss it. Enjoy your holiday. Thanks for listening. Go Hawks.